All right, guys, so I did have my, oh, I have had my first light with this mount. And first off, I just wanted to show you what I had it mounted on. So this is my HEQ5 Pro. Um, it's got a payload of about 13 odd kilos. So more than adequate for a, a scope like this. Um, as you can see, this look, I've got one counterweight. I got one counterweight on here and this balances, this balances signs. So you might say that this is a touch over mounted for this. Um, but you know, if this is your first telescope, it depends really what you want to do. I would probably say you'd be okay with the, um, the mount down from this, which is like the EQ um, 35 or maybe the Ioptron equivalent. Something that's probably got, you know, a good double the weight of this is always usually a good way to go. So maybe something that's got a payload of about maximum payload, of like eight or nine kilos would probably be nice for something like this. Um, I know it does come, I know you can get this with the AZ GTI. I don't know, it depends what you're doing. I mean, if you're just doing planetary and um, lunar, you may get away with that, but I don't know what that mount would be like in terms of um, steadiness with a, you know, with a scope like this onto it. Uh, certainly if you're gonna do deep sky astro, I, I'm, I'm doubting that would be, um, I'm doubting that would be adequate. Not that this is really meant for deep sky astrophotography, it's more for planetary and lunar, but um, just one thing to consider anyway. Now, in terms of dew, you will need to just make sure, obviously this is gonna dew over, so I ended up putting this little um, dew heater strap off my Esprit onto this scope, and that did a fine job. Basically, I just put it, just put it around the front here, you know, near that corrector plate, make sure that it doesn't dew over and that works well. You could equally, you could equally just cut um, a dew shield out yourself. You can, you know, a lot of people just make these themselves out of a bit of black plastic or something like that. Um, and I probably will get one of those at some point, but I don't have one at the moment. Um, in terms of, I did explain in my last video that the reason I was looking at this telescope is I really wanted to get something for visual. So I did just use the, um, I basically just used the SynScan app to try and control it. I am, um, I did have a bit of a disaster on the first night. I could not get this thing to align properly. Um, however, on the second night I did manage to crack it. So you just need to go through your alignment procedure with this. Um, you are obviously at quite a, you are at a long focal length on this. So it's probably useful going through a three star alignment with this kind of um, telescope so you get a bit more um, accuracy when pointing to those planets and do make sure that you've got your do make sure that you've got your guide scope well aligned before you actually go out there and do some um, observations because it's going to be useful for that alignment um, what else have we got here so focusing was fine I didn't have any real I didn't really have any issues with focus obviously this is just manual focus um, so I'm out there, I'm out there obviously doing the manual focus. And if you were using a camera, you're going to need to obviously be there with your laptop and then adjusting, you know, adjusting your focus and sort of looking back at your image to, as a reference point. But no real issues, you know, it all feels pretty solid. Um, this two inch, this two inch back here, I will probably will replace this. It's, it's just two of these little screws here and I would prefer a compression ring to be honest. So I probably will replace this. I do have my own uh, two inch diagonal in here, the William Optics diagonal. And I did take um, a few little test images, which I will show you. I'll show you those images soon um, using the um, ASI 482 camera here, one shot color camera. But that's pretty much it. I just wanted to show you the setup and what I had this mounted on. Um, because sometimes it's just useful, especially if you're new to the hobby, just to get an idea of how I've, you know, how somebody's um, got this mounted or what it might be um, appropriate for. So let's put this now down onto the table and let's just have a little bit more of a look at maybe some of the images and what I thought of the telescope in general. All right, guys, so what did I reckon to this scope? So look, it actually fit perfectly. For me, what I was after, it fit perfectly. So I wanted a small scope that was um, mainly I was going to be using for lunar and a little bit of planetary. And like I said, occasionally maybe for those really bright sort of deep sky objects to have a look as well. 
So what did I actually visually have a look at? So I spent a lot of time on the moon. Now you've got to remember because you're at, with this scope, you're at 1500 millimeters, you are going to be, you know, fairly close into the moon. So what I did is I've, I've got a couple of eyepieces here and I found that this, this is a Hyperion, the Barda Hyperion. This is a 24 millimeter eyepiece. So something around that 25 millimeter mark with this scope um, or wider, will fit in the moon. So I could just get the moon in fully with the 25 millimeter eyepiece at this focal length of 1500 millimeters. Um, so definitely like obviously really good for lunar and that's obviously one of the things that this scope is designed for. Um, in terms of visual again, I also took a look at um, a couple of the clusters. So I took a look at um, the cluster there in um, Amiga Centauri and um, cluster. And I also took a look at Tuk, Tukane down here, um, Tuk 27, I think. And um, both of those were, were quite faint, but I could make them out. Now it was nearly a full moon night, so that probably wasn't helping me looking at the clusters and whatnot, but I was able to make those clusters out, which was really nice. Um, I did have a brief look at, um, you know, Orion, but you know, at F12, you're not really gonna see a lot there, even in the core of Orion. One thing I'll mention is, at least for me, I found, you know, looking at the moon, moon's obviously very bright. So I've got this little Optolong um, variable, you know, polarizing filter. There's bunches of different brands of these, but really useful. If you're new to, if you're new to astronomy and you want to look at the moon, it's, it can be pretty blinding when it's a full moon. So having one of these little one and a quarter screw inch, one and a quarter screw in filters, or you can get two inch versions, depends what eyepiece you've got. They can be really handy. And then basically, I don't know if you can see that, but you can just change how light or dim that is. So it lets less of the light through, so it's not quite so harsh on your eyes. And it also just enables you to pick out a little bit more detail there on the moon if you've, um, you know, because it's not quite so bright. So yeah, visually looking at the moon was, was great and that's, you know, really what I wanted. I also, um, I also have this 13 millimeter IP, so that was really nice to get in even closer to some of those craters on the moon, like Olympus Mons and all that kind of stuff. Um, the other pro for this was the weight of it. So within those, within that 10 day period, I have taken this out three times. And like I showed before, on this mount, it's just it makes this thing quite doable and quite portable. So generally the lighter a scope is, the more inclined you're gonna to be to actually want to put it on your mount and, um, and do some visual. Because if it weighs a ton and you're not gonna use it for very long, sometimes that can be, um, it just, unless you have a permanent setup, it's not always conducive for you actually to getting out. So with this being so light, it was just easy to chuck on my mount and like I said, have a bit of a look. Now, um, of course, beyond, beyond visual, I wasn't able to resist having a quick go with this. And um, I'll, I'll put those pictures up for you as we go. But I basically put in this little ASI 482 camera, which I often use. It's a one-shot um, color, non-cooled camera. Very commonly used for things like the, the moon and the planets, that kind of thing. I've used this for the planets um, quite often. You know, if you're new to any sort of photography with these guys, um, one of these little planetary cameras like this are, are ideal. And the, the ASI224 is also a great little camera to get you started, not, um, you know, not quite as expensive as this one. You will need some sort of little um, UV IR cup filter to screw into the end there. But what I then did is I took some images of the moon. So I took some video of the moon and I'll put those up for you now, those two images that I took of the moon. Really like pleasing shots. Um, probably I think about 500 frames each. So you're obviously taking video when you're doing things like the moon. So, um, you know, I took a few seconds of video which was 500 frames and then I put that through auto stacker and I put that through Registack. So, to stack that video and to sharpen that. And yeah, they came out They came out pretty nice. I'm sure with a bit more time, I could have done a better job with those, but I just wanted a quick, 
I just wanted to give a quick impression of, you know, you can obviously get some nice images of the moon if that's what you're, if that's what you're into as well. If you want to just um, dabble in, if you want to just dabble in a bit of photography. The planets are obviously not around at the moment for me, so I couldn't do any planetary, but I will try that, you know, when they're back around. Um, now I did try a little bit of deep sky. I left this camera in, so I thought, I'm just gonna do this with the with the planetary camera that I've got, which is a fairly small sensor. So I did um, I did a little bit on Orion. So there's 10 30 seconds exposures here of Orion. Now obviously I'm I'm in very close, so we're looking at Orion's core, and that's only 10 exposures at 30 seconds. So it's like you know we're talking a five minutes worth. So you could you could do a much better job of that. But that's just to give you a flavor that if you wanted to on those brighter objects, you can do a little bit of photography with this guy. I did also, um, I also did um, Amiga Centauri, the cluster again, um, and I did 10 exposures there for 30 seconds. And you can see that's not too bad. So, uh, you know, a nice little image there close in on that cluster. And then finally, I had a go at what was my third object that I did now? I did Amiga Centauri, blah, blah, blah. Oh, and I did Centaurus A, the galaxy. So obviously at F12 here, I'm only taking one minute exposures. So, you know, relatively short exposures considering how slow a scope I'm running here. Um, considering I would probably normally take that on my C925, which is half the focal ratio of this at F6. Um, but as you can see, you know, just for a bit of a mess around, that's literally five one minute exposures on um, Centaurus A. So you can see, if you want to, you could take a few little images there. I don't think, like I said, I don't think deep sky astrophotography is really what this thing is designed for. I think it's more lunar and planetary, but it's nice to know that you can have a play there if you want to. One thing I will say is if you are gonna be looking at doing any astrophotography with this guy, like deep sky astro, just be aware that the focal length of this being 1500 millimeters means that um, you're going to need to look at guiding and you're not really going to be able to guide with a guide scope at this focal length. So I haven't looked around, but I think that you would probably need to invest in something like an off-axis guider um, to do that kind of, you know, those long exposures. For me, that's not going to be what I'm using it for. This is going to be a visual scope for me with a little bit of planetary and lunar um, but just consider that if you are thinking about this for deep sky astrophotography it's not really what it's designed for and you are going to need a way to be able to guide at that kind of focal length um, the, the next thing is the focuser again if you were doing deep sky astrophotography um, I don't know if anybody's yet come up with a solution for an automated focuser for this. I'm sure somebody probably has, somebody's probably made an adapter, but just another thing to consider. So yeah, um, that's basically, guys, my overview of the SkyMax 127. I think it's a great little scope. I think it's a great little scope um, for visual um, astronomy and to get you into looking at the moon and um, the planets and some of those brighter objects. I think it's so portable. It's got that 1500 millimeter focal length. Um, you know, you might want to change the diagonal on it. You do at least get one decent eyepiece with it, which is great. Like I said, it's a, the free eyepiece that you get with it, which I don't have here is about 27 millimeters. So it'll be fine for fitting the, fitting the moon in. Um, and yeah, um, it turned out pretty much the way that um, I was hoping for with this scope. So um, I hope for any of you guys out there who were maybe looking at this scope, that might have given you a better idea of what its strengths are um, and some of its cons, obviously. So without further ado, I will say good day to you. And um, if you feel like a like and a subscribe, that's always really handy. And um, yeah. Clear skies to you all, and I will see you on the next video. Cheers, guys.